Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. I really do appreciate these men. And again, a couple years ago, we sent out some sign-up sheets for small groups. I don't think we got too many people that were interested in it, but I think it's such an important, important part of church where church needs to go. What we need to accomplish if we're going to have the level of fellowship that God has asked us and desires for us to have among believers. Our, truly, our fellowship was with the Lord and with the Lord Jesus Christ and with, with God our Father, but he has given us brothers and sisters on this earth that are so critical. I'd like to have you start off by taking your Bible, please, and turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 22. We're looking at the mission of our church this week, or this weekend, and we've had three messages already on, of course, on community, and then Logan was preaching on, of course, the, the, the background of what small groups are all about. But uh, we're going to start off with Romans chapter 8, verse 22, for just a few moments. When God created this world, this world was perfect. It was good, it was good, it was very good. That's how God pronounced each day. When he created man, man was the highest of his creation. And God put this man in this environment where the animals lived together, perfect harmony. They needed each other. The sun shone, the moon the stars, the creation was exactly as God intended it. And again, God filled creation because every aspect of creation was a testimony to his attributes. And when you looked at creation, you could see God everywhere because God's eternity was in view of it with the stars and his love and compassion were very, very easily seen in all that he had created on this earth. But it wasn't long, and you, man fell into sin. And I can't even begin to explain the difference that took place with that one sin to creation. At one point, you know, there's no such thing as death, there's no such thing as sickness, there's no such thing as a cold or the flu, there's no weeds, there's no storms, there's no earthquakes, there's nothing. And then all of a sudden you have a cat cataclysmic event, the fall. And we read in Romans 8.22, the verse I asked you to turn to, it says, For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain. All of creation is travailing in pain together until now. And I don't have to describe to you the change that took place in this creation because it's hard to find harmony, it's hard to find peace anywhere. And I think church is about as close as you will come to what God intended life to be like on this earth. But even in church, the relationships that we have in church are potential minefields that can cause tremendous hurt tremendous anxiety and you know what it means to see churches that do not have peace, that do not have unity. But it's hard to find any relationship without war and fighting and bickering and even among, among children in a family. Now again, there's many words that came to the vocabulary of man that were never used before the fall. You have sorrow, disease, death, killing, murder. You have guilt, shame, fear, blame. And all of these things were added to that creation that God had placed upon this earth. And man really is in sad shape. Now you look at it and you say, we have fallen so far from what God intended and the world that we're living in today, it's hard to imagine it can get any worse. Because we have sauntered so far from what God had determined for this, 
this world and the morality and the desire for God. Satan came, of course, to Adam and Eve in the garden and he said to Eve, you will be like gods. But folks, that is not the primary problem. You look at this, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Why <laughs> would God's creature that was created by God, that's part of this entire universe, part of the glory of God, that when God created man, he made him in his image. And here you have this man who is God's highest creation, who is hiding himself and does not want to be found by God. And God seeks for this man and says, where are you, Adam? I hid myself. Now you take this man, again, that God pronounces very good, and this man has separated himself from all of that universe, all of God's glory, all of God's attributes. And what Satan is ask, actually offering man is independent glory. That you now have the right, if you want that right, to be autonomous. That you can self-govern your own affairs. You don't have to let God direct and, de and, and determine your steps where you're going to live and what you're going to do and what you can eat and what you can't eat. Adam, you have the right now with autonomy to eat anything you want in the garden. And so man has been changed from this highest creature of God to this five to six foot box and if you've heard Donald Trump on, on the news the other day, he doesn't need counselors because his mind is so intelligent that he can get all of his help from his own mind. Did you hear that? Anyone hear that? <laughs> so all of this, this grandeur is now in this five to six foot by 18 inch box, you know. And that we can go through this world with autonomy and we can be separated from God and we can get all of our strength from ourselves. David Tripp, to hide from the Creator is hide from his true identity. Whereas at one time he's part of that glory, now he's separated himself with autonomy and he's making his own decision, determining what life is, and his life is all about his life. It's reduced to what's within him, and life became death, and man has been seeking for independent glory. As I shared with you before, Isaiah 53, 6, which is one of the clearest definitions of sin in the Bible. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Yes, that's a definition of sin. It's short of God's glory. But one of the clearest definitions of sins in the Bible, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. I do not need God. I do not want God. I am fine just the way I am. I like being able to govern my affairs. I like being able to have the independence to determine where I want to go, what I want to do with my life, what I want to eat. I want that choice. And if I give my life over to God, God will start making those choices for me. And I don't want God to make those choices for me because I like independence. I like to be able to, to govern my own direction. And I just look at that and I say, well, how's that working for you? How's that working for you? In this world that we're living in, mankind trying to find God on his own, how's that working for you? Listen, God has created an incredible universe, an incredible planet, and you can spend your entire existence on this planet traveling to see new places and new things that God has created. And your life will be all about your choice of wherever you want to go, doing whatever you want to do, spending your money whatever way you want to spend it. And friends, frankly, I want you to understand that has entered into the church. The church likes to be able to come on Sunday morning because then I don't feel guilty about the rest of the week. I did my, my job. I did my work. I came to church. I did what God asked me to do, the rest of the time is mine. 
And because I did what God wanted me to do this week, I can be self-autonomous the rest of the week. And God is really there to provide for my needs to make me happy. And the whole nature of self-autonomy is what makes me happy. And it has led to all kinds of addictions on this earth where people are addicted to all kinds of things where they're addicted to entertainment, they're addicted to drugs, they're addicted to alcohol, they're addicted to sex, and all kinds of addictions that are destroying families, destroying homes, so that mankind can go his way in independence and do what he wants to do. And again, I ask you, how is that working for you? Friends, I want you to understand, when you look at the world today, the family is really hurting today. It's really hurting because husbands and wives are autonomous. And they do not need God. And if God does anything to them to hurt them, then God is bad. And I don't want anything to do with God because he put cancer in, in my life and I don't like cancer. Therefore, I don't need God. Because God is there to make me happy. God is there to help me to be autonomous. And again, the further down the path of autonomy, the more death, the more addiction, the, more, the less responsibility, the less relationships... And friends, as you look at our world today, relationships have really struggled. Do you agree? We have a real difficult time sustaining relationships. We do not want really, really close friends because they reject us. And so because of that, we just have acquaintances. Lots of acquaintances, but we do not want to give ourselves to those friendships because it's very frightening to give yourself to friendships where it can lead to a lack, lack of happiness, a lack of peace, and a lack of meaning. Share it with you the problem. Once again, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. We go through the problem here. Romans chapter 3. We'll start reading in verse 9. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever things the law says to, it says to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we read down verse 23. For, the, for all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. We have a problem. There's nobody on this earth that seeks after God. There's nobody who desires God. Friends, part of the fall of man. And whether you like to admit it or not, it is inside of us. This is not out there. I'm not talking about there. Romans 3, 10 through 23 is true of us. We want our autonomy. We want to be able to self-govern ourselves, to govern our families, to govern our, govern our choices. It's what we desire. But, again, as I said to you before, there is no freedom in self-autonomy. Please understand what I'm saying. People think that that is liberty, but all it does is lead to sin and addiction. The Bible says this, What know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servant you are to whom you obey, whether of obedience, or sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We have a choice, but the choice is not between freedom and God. Again, the choice is not between freedom and God. The choice is between God and slavery and bondage to sin. 
And if you reject God, you will choose a bondage to sin and you will be corrupted. You will be captivated by what sin asks you to do. The Jewish people didn't believe it. They answered, we be Abraham's seed. Never been in bondage to every man. How do you say we'll be made free? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. And remember, just a short time later, Jesus said this, If the Son shall make you free, you'll be free indeed. You want to understand true freedom. Freedom does not come by autonomy. Freedom does not come by your right to rule your own life. Satan has blinded the minds, and whom the God of this world had blinded the minds. We don't see that. We don't understand that. The world doesn't understand it. If they don't see that God is not the source of bondage. Sin is the source of bondage. If you decide, decide that what you want is freedom from God, you will not have freedom from sin. Sin will become very much your master. And it will determine what you're going to be doing. Now please, we all understand what the resurrection of Christ is about. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he slayed me, he, he freed me from the worst taskmaster. He freed me from the worst taskmaster, the taskmaster of sin. He died for all of my sin. He gave me a gift of eternal life. He died upon the cross and then he rose again from the dead. And that says a couple things to me. <laughs> Number one, that means evolution is not true. Why? Because God has the power of life. God is the one, if he raised up Jesus from the dead, <laughs> that's not evolution. The resurrection is contrary to evolution. What it says is God is the one who has the power of life. He had the power to give his life, he had the power to take it again. And if God could raise up Jesus from the dead, that means he could create me. He could create all of us in his image if he could raise up Christ from the dead. So therefore, this one who raised Christ from the dead, he is the one who has the power of life. And that means that in the future, because he has the power of life, I will live. Even though I die, I will live. Because he has the power to defeat death in my life and give me a resurrected body as well. John 10, 10, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And let me just say this again. <laughs> when you talk about autonomy, my right to govern myself, God has something far greater than that for me. He has something far greater than autonomy. He said, I want you to have life. That's quantity. And I want you to have it more abundantly. That's quality. And God has something far greater than autonomy. Because God wants me to connect it with all of the glories of the universe. That was all introduction. <laughs> so now we just want to look at what the point is here. And again, the rest of this will go quickly. But Christ's purpose of coming to earth. I want you to understand, if you're listening by way of television, this will be on television this coming week for our Easter Sunday service. I want you to understand the Bible is very clear that Jesus Christ had a purpose in coming to the earth. We were sinners. We committed sin against God. He came to this earth to die upon the cross for our sins. The Bible says when we were yet without strength, Christ died. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Jesus is not willing 
to condemn this world. He does not want this world. That's not why he came to this earth. For God sent not a son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He did not come to condemn it. Now let me say this. He could have. We deserve to be condemned. With all that you read in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 23, we deserve condemnation. There's none that seeks after God. There's none righteous. We all deserve condemnation. But God did not want us to be condemned. He did not want us to go to hell. And again, he came and he paid the price for that sins. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God. And again, this is not religion. Religion says do good. Live a good life. Go to sacraments. Keep the Ten Commandments. Be baptized. Join the church. Give your money. Do penance. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. The reason is, if it weren't a gift, none of us could receive it because none of us are good enough to get it without a gift. We don't have the payment to pay for the price of eternal life. The price of eternal life is perfection and none of us are perfect. So Jesus took our sin and he died for all of our sin and he gives us his righteousness the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> and once again, friends, once again, God is recreating a new creation, a recreation. You are being recreated in the image of God. He is placing the Holy Spirit within you if you put your trust in Christ. And you once again... Transcendence, you can be a part of something greater than this five to six foot frame. You can be a part of the glory of God's creation. You wonder why I put this in here, especially if you're, you're watching by way of television. I want you to understand this has been God's plan from the very beginning. It never changed. This was God's plan when He created man. God did not make a mistake when man sinned. From the very beginning, God knew that he had to send his son to die on the cross. He knew that. The Bible says the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Way back in the book of Psalms, chapter 22, way back in Psalms 22, and by the way, Psalms 22 it begins with the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? With the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. But this is a prophecy of Jesus that said, The dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me, and that is a picture of a crucifixion. When would you ever have your hands and feet pierced? Especially you go back a thousand years before Jesus died on the cross, that's not how they crucified people. They didn't kill people by capital punishment, by crucifixion. Capital punishment in those days was by stoning. Remember, the Jewish people believed in stoning, and so that's what the Old Testament taught. A thousand years before Jesus Christ came, he said, they pierced my hands and my feet. What's that about? It's a prophecy of a crucifixion. And God knew exactly what was going to be happening years and years before Jesus ever was born. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. What does this mean? The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Who is that? Who did God lay our iniquity on? Again, 700 years before Christ. Who was it that God laid that iniquity upon? You know, I use this illustration often, but again, this is important. It's so important. I want to make it as clear as possible, especially if people are watching by way of television next week. You understand there's a judge sitting upon the throne and this judge is known for passing very severe penalties. And he slams the gavel down so easily and just passes a punishment of 500 days in jail and, or 90 days in jail and a $500 fine. He gives the worst possible penalty. Now one day his best friend comes in the courtroom his best friend walks up and his best friend has been accused of a crime. And there's evidence to support that his best friend was breaking the law in the way he was driving his car. But he's coming before his best friend, the judge. And the judge, <laughs> this judge is a stickler for always giving the worst penalty. So the best friend comes before the, the judgment seat and the judge slams down the gavel and he says, 
$500 fine, 90 days in jail. And the best friend's mouth drops. She, I can't believe you did that to me. Your best friend, you did that. I can't believe you did that to me. <laughs> really disappointed. But the judge has a responsibility to carry out justice. He's not going to break the rules for his best friend. He has to pass judgment. <laughs> and so he passes the judgment and then the judge pushes back his throne he takes his robe off, places it over his chair, and he walks down to the church clerk and he takes out his wallet and he writes a check for $500 and gives it to the clerk. If he could, he would spend the 90 days in jail. But please understand, God's in heaven and he has to be judged, just. He must be just. And he slams down the gavel and he says, the soul that sinneth, it must die. The wages of sin is death. And he slams down the gavel and he says, I'm passing my sentence against you. And then the judge takes off his robes. He steps down from the throne. He comes to this earth and he dies upon the cross for those that he passed the sentence against. Understand, that's who God is. Jesus Christ is God without the robes. Jesus Christ is God without the robes. He passed the sentence and then he paid that penalty for us because the Bible says he's not willing that any should perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And God is not forcing you to accept that gift. God's not going to force you to accept it. By love, he's giving you the choice of either receiving what Jesus Christ did on the cross for your sake or paying for your sins. And if you pay for your sins, the wages of sin is death. You will pay for sin by death on the cross. What is the purpose of the resurrection? God proved that he accepted Jesus' death by the resurrection. God made it clear that he accepted the death of Christ because of the resurrection. The debt was paid. Sin was paid for. Jesus did conquer death. And the Bible says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet in your sins. If he did not rise from the dead, you would still be in sin. Now having said that, if the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. It's not a choice between autonomy and freedom. Between autonomy and lack of freedom. Our purpose in living. Now how does this all fit into what we're talking about in this church? How does this all fit in? Remember I'm telling you this. Satan promised Adam and Eve they could have an independent glory. You will be like God's. You can have an independent glory. You don't need God anymore to have glory. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. What is this about? It is about I have a choice to make as a believer, as a Christian, whether I'm going to live for him or whether I'm going to live for myself. And I am way too busy doing my own work to do God's work. It is overwhelming for me to try to do his work and my work. I can't do his work and my work. His work gets in the way, and because I'm trying to do his work, I don't get my work accomplished, and my work is really important. So somehow I have to get rid of his work so I can do my work. And I will come Sunday morning. I will come and I will give God an hour a week. That's fine. I can do that. But the rest of the time is mine. We are fighting a battle in the church today, and the battle is autonomy. 
Who wants to govern? I want to govern. We all want to govern. We want to govern our own life. We do not want God to govern it. We want Christ to serve us, to give us eternal life, to give us eternal peace and joy so we can have more. We give him a portion so we can keep the remainder. Please take your Bible here in closing and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. This is the mission of a church in a nutshell. This is the summation to everything that God says in the New Testament. This is summation to everything that God says in the Bible. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We don't look at people after the flesh. Obviously, there's still sin in this room. We're all sinners. There's still sin in this room. But the very next verse says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. You are a new creation. God has recreated you to be where you were before the fall of man. That you can actually walk with God once again in the heat of the day. That you can spend time with him. You can be a part of his glory. You can be a part of God's eternal universe. But my job is not to build up my kingdom, it's to build up his kingdom. I didn't come here to make my kingdom stronger. I don't want my kingdom to be the most, the most important part in my life. Friends, do you understand that for the great, great part of our life, my life included, we are trying to build up a kingdom. <laughs> We want a kingdom, and we want to reign, and we want our kingdom to be important. We want people to notice our kingdom. And if we're honest with ourselves, we'll understand that's the battle we're fighting here. All things are of God who hath reconciled. Now, you know what that means? When we fell, <laughs> we fell into this Stupid mode of autonomy. And God says, I can bring you back to myself. I can get you out of that five to six foot shell. And I can make you part of this glorious kingdom of mine. And give you freedom that you could never have in that little box that you live in. Where your whole life is about that little box. Making that box look good. I can get you away from that. The addictions that you have. He reconciled to us to himself by Jesus Christ, hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto us. Listen to this. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. This is the Bible in a nutshell. This is what God has asked us to do. This is what it's all about, whether it's going to be about my kingdom or his kingdom. That God has made me his ambassador on this earth so I could give them the word of reconciliation, so I could teach them about the greatest freedom that they can ever understand is being a part of God's kingdom. And not trying to strengthen their own kingdom. The further they go down the path of autonomy, the more problems they're going to have. Righteousness is true freedom. And Jesus says, if the Son shall make you free, you'll be free indeed. One of the biggest problems that we have in this world, and not in church, but in this world, is there's no purpose. <laughs> there's no purpose out there. The purpose is just to have the next good experience, the good, next good time, the next fun time. And God has given us an incredible purpose to help reconcile this world back to him. To bring the world back into reconciliation with God's plan. 
So we can be a part of this transcendence of God. Life outside of this body. Life part of the glory of God. The word transcendence just means life outside beyond this physical. And we can be beyond that. We don't have to be within this five to six foot box. Make sense? Amen. Friends, this is the mission of the church. This is what God has asked us to do. And it's all going to come down to that. Am I too busy? Is it about my kingdom? Is it about his kingdom? What is it about? Who is going to reign and rule in my life? as a believer in Christ. Once again, we wanna thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him, that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today. 